And now we are gonna continue in our series, The Deeply Formed Life, and today we're talking about sexual wholeness. Now, uh, a lot of you guys know I'm single. Not an advertisement. <laughs> or is it? And it's not, it's not. Um, you know, and as I was preparing for this talk in the last couple of weeks and talking with people about what I was going to be sharing on, uh, I was met with a lot of interesting responses. I was met with jokes. I was met with uh, people being perplexed. I was met with people genuinely asking, like, why would you be the one sharing on this? And maybe some of you are thinking that this morning. And, I mean, if I can be frank, and I'm going to be, I usually am, I mean, sometimes those comments come across as dismissive and nearsighted. And the reason that a single person is talking about this is because we need to hear about this from a single person. Uh, this is... It's, it's, there's a type of thinking under some of those comments that says, well, if you're not having sex, then you have nothing to say about it. And that says, underneath that even, it says that we think of sex primarily as just the physical act itself. And sex and sexuality is about a whole lot more than that. So we need to hear this specifically from a single person because not everyone in our church is a married person, but everyone in our church is a sexual person. Everyone in our church is created as a sexual being. So my hope for today is to paint a compelling vision of sexuality based on Scripture's vision of intimacy for all people, married or single. And I think this will require us to expand our vision of sexuality in places where we've unhelpfully narrowed it. And in some places, it'll, it'll call us to narrow our vision of sexuality where we've unhelpfully expanded it. So what does it mean to be sexually whole? as a married or a single person? Is sexual wholeness even a possibility for someone who was not having it? Was Jesus sexually whole? Yes. And does having it in the context of marriage automatically mean that we are sexually whole and we don't need to listen to anything the sermon says? You know, I think we fall into the falsely dichotomous thinking that for the married person, it's an automatic, yeah, you are in sexual wholeness as long as you are having sex in the context of marriage. And then we go for the single person, I, I guess maybe that's just not even a category for you, so I... Uh, Hurry up and get married and hold on until then. And both of those are unhelpful ways to think. So we're gonna take a kind of broad, big picture today. We're not gonna hone in on hot button issues. I'm not talking about issues of orientation or gender or any of those things. Because if we're even gonna have helpful conversations about any of that stuff, we need to have a good framework within which to have those conversations. And that's what I'm hoping to address today is that really big picture framework of sexuality. So we're gonna focus on three sections. What is forming us sexually? What does scripture say? And what do we do? And I'm telling you at the, the beginning, uh, this is going to be wildly inadequate. I am not going to cover everything. Um, I'm not gonna cover maybe the thing that you want me to say or talk about. Uh, I'm not going to talk about every single what if or exception on any of like the big, big picture principles I'm giving. I just don't have the time to do it. So I'm asking us ahead of time for our generosity as I try and tackle an incredibly large subject here. So uh, are you with me? Thank you. Uh, Lord, be with me. <laughs> be with me as these people are. Be with us. Jesus, if what you have to say about sexuality as the creator of it is really good for every person, no matter what their particular situation. We need you to show us that. So let my words be your words. Give us a vision for sexual wholeness and intimacy, whether we're single or married, and help us live into that as your church community uh, life center. So we ask that stuff in your name, Jesus, everybody said. Amen. So we're going through the book Deeply Formed Life, but also Rich, the author of Deeply Formed Life, references a book called Sexual Character by Marva Dawn. And, uh, oh man, it's good. I ended up reading that book too. So I'm gonna reference her book a lot as well. Sexual Character by Marva Dawn. If you're looking for more resources, it's so good. Go read it, okay? So in the chapters on sexuality, Rich in Deeply Formed Life says, here's what he wants. He wants to provide a pathway that helps us make sense of our emotional and sexual longings and to show how our bodies have everything to do with God and our spiritual development. So right away, he acknowledges something that we often do not. Our spirituality and our sexuality are intimately connected. Why don't we often think of them this way? Well, for numerous reasons, right? Sex is so often connected to shameful feelings. It's been stigmatized in the church for years. And often we feel as if it's an inherently dirty thing. And also we think of spirituality primarily in abstract, intangible terms, having to do with my internal self or being or spirit or soul. And sex has to do with our bodies. 
it's gritty, grounded, earthy, and we automatically separate body and soul in our culture. So when we talk about spiritual development, we see sex really is more or less inconsequential to it. Like, what if I asked us this question, what does your sex life have to do with God? It's kind of a weird question, right? It feels maybe even inappropriate or, like, or just doesn't make any sense because those categories don't intersect. But my hope is that the deeply formed Christian would have answers to these questions that really do intersect real life, that we do understand how our sexuality and spirituality are connected. So let's define spirituality and sexuality. Rich uses author Deborah Hirsch's definitions from her book, Redeeming Sex, and here's what she says. I think it's helpful. Spirituality can be described as a vast longing that drives us beyond ourselves in an attempt to connect with, to probe, to understand our world. And beyond that, it is the inner compulsion to connect with the eternal other, which is God. Essentially, it's a longing to know and be known by God on physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual levels. Sexuality can be described as the deep desire and longing that drives us beyond ourselves in an attempt to connect with, to understand that which is other than ourselves. Essentially, it's a longing to be known, to know and be known by other people on physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual levels. So at the heart of both of these is this idea of longing that drives us beyond ourselves. It's about a search. It's about this inherent understanding that we know in and of ourselves, we, we, we're driven beyond that to something bigger. And so now when we think of it in those terms, maybe we have more of a category to talk about, okay, what does my sexuality have to do with my spirituality? So let's keep going here. What is forming us sexually? We think we already, maybe you think you know the sermon already, right? Where it's just another sermon where I get up here and I say, if you're married, go for it. If you're single, take a cold shower. Sex is like a fire. It's good in the fireplace. Destructive out of it. All the things we've heard already, okay? Those are all good and fine things. Um, and to be, to, I guess to clarify, maybe you're asking this question, I am speaking out of a historic, tra traditional Christian sexual ethic today. And so, yeah, I, I, I think those things are, are good and true. Um, and you can think those things are good and true too. But we also have to look at our reality is that the church looks statistically almost no different from the world when it comes to our sexual practices. Whether it's premarital, extramarital, uh, addiction, marriages where there's issues, uh, I mean, we think, maybe we even think, as Christians, as Jesus people, we think the Bible's standards for this, or vision for this, is outdated, tone deaf, archaic, damaging, or dehumanizing. There have been significant abuse issues, not just in the world, but in the church. I mean, it's, it's just a mess, right? But we're supposed to be different. As the community of Jesus people, we're supposed to be a vision to the world of what is good and what is fulfilling and what is flourishing. And it's really interesting to me that in my 12 years of pastoring, among serious Jesus followers, this is always the one thing, this is the one thing above all other things where we are happy to convince ourselves we know better. Everything else scripture says that could be difficult, right? Like love your enemy, very, very difficult thing to do. But we go, yeah, I understand how that's good, and I, I like that. Die to yourself. We go, I understand how that's good, and I like that, even if I have trouble obeying it. But when it comes to this stuff, we go, I don't really like that. And in fact, I think I know better. And my situation's different. Or we think that we've come to a place where we just understand this better now. Well, we know better now. We're mature enough now to handle these things because we have all these helpful preventative measures for, for this and for that. And I, I think we know better now. And I just... We're, we're, we say to God and everybody else, you, you don't get to tell me what to do with this part of my life because it is wholly mine. And, uh, and we just think we know better. And I just go, look at our world. Like, do we really? Do we really know how to handle sexuality? Like, look at the brokenness that is just in, in, in the church and the world. Do we really know better? Are we really mature enough to handle this? And that kind of relationship, when you say, no, this is mine, this is wholly mine, and I'm the one who gets to determine what is good, bad, right, wrong with this, you know what that's called? That's called idolatry. And that is what I'm saying is forming us. We are being formed by an idolatry of romantic and sexual fulfillment and an idolatry of self-expression in our culture. And idolatry is a precise word. When we think of idolatry, we think of two things, right? We think of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, like people in funny hats bound down to big statues, and we go, well, obviously I'm not an idolater because I don't do that. Or we, we minimize it 
and we think of it in terms of like, oh, I idolize this person. Like, I look up to them. They're important to me. I elevate them in my life. That's, that's much too uh, small a view of idolatry. So here's what idolatry is. It's not overtly worshiping something that is obviously wrong or evil, and it's not merely making something important. Idolatry can be taking a good thing and making it an ultimate thing. There's another precise word in there, ultimate. What does ultimate mean? Well, think of an ultimatum. Has anybody ever given you an ultimatum? What are they saying when they give you an ultimatum? They're saying it's this or nothing. And that is our relationship with sexual and romantic fulfillment and self-expression in our culture. We are saying, if I don't have this, I have nothing. And it's poisoning us. Now, a note on self-expression. The first, or the most important thing or highest good in our society today is to be authentic to yourself and to express that or act on that, right? If you don't express it, it's damaging, repressive, dehumanizing. So we start in this place already when we approach sexuality where we've decided that the individual in all places and all things best knows and understands their own self. Bible says the heart's deceitful above all else, by the way. And they get that, and the individual gets to be the sole arbiter of determining what is good and bad, right and wrong, in an absolute sense. And this is the original idolatry, friends. This is Genesis chapter three. This is Adam and Eve in the garden. And they see the fruit of the tree of what? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they want that for themselves. They want the knowledge of good and evil for themselves. The knowledge and ability to determine right and wrong, good and bad, is subject to nobody, no thing outside of my very self. That's what they're saying when they take that fruit. They want to be the sole determiners of that ability to look at something and pronounce it good. And this is exactly taking the role of God because we are two chapters past where God creates something and said, this is good. Creates another thing and says, that's good. Creates another thing and says, that is good. Why does he get to pronounce what is good? Because he made it. And here's how we think. We, we all have good and natural sexual urges. Yes, we do. But because of our idolatry of self-expression, we think to suppress them or for anybody to tell us anything about what is helpful in that area is repressive or bad. What we do with these is up to us only. So here's the train of thought. Because it's natural, it's my true self. And because it's natural, it's good. Therefore, we've pronounced the freedom to express ourselves sexually because we get to determine what is good. We've pronounced the freedom to express ourselves sexually in ways that we, in our own idolatrous confusion, have called good. And right now, after that sentence, which is aggressive, um, I think a lot of us in this room might be thinking of other people. Yeah, the world and those people and these people that, that don't understand sexuality. No, 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 you're not allowed to externalize. I'm talking to us this morning. I'm talking to you. We all have sexually deformed messages. We, we are in this, this is the air we breathe of sexual and romantic fulfillment as the end all be all in our world. So I don't want you to externalize and think of the other right now. I want us to examine ourselves as Jesus people. Marva Don writes in her book, basically the assumption in our society is that genital sexual expression is the be all end all of human existence. Persons deserve sexual pleasure. They must have it and no matter what, they will have it. So therefore it's dehumanizing from a cultural perspective to put any sorts of limits on what's appropriate sexual or romantic expression. Because if I don't have this, I have nothing. And can I just tell you today, like, I sympathize with this, this worldview. Like, I'm in this. This is me. Like, I have sexual urges. And I'm 38 and single, okay? Like, guys, I feel this. I'm not coming to you from a place of, like, oh, the biblical ethic doesn't, doesn't put any constraints or anything on my life. Like, I understand how this affects me. I don't, want you to, I don't want you to hear from me like, oh yeah, this isn't a big deal for me, whatever, y'all, y'all need to be like, as, handle this as well as I, like no. I'm in this idolatrous mindset too, like I want to be married, I want to, I want to have desires fulfilled, and there have been times when I'm like, am, like it, it, God, am I gonna be single for, it's like, am I called to celibacy, please, Lord, no. Okay, but right there, even that joke and that thinking shows you that that idolatry of romantic and sexual fulfillment in various ways is an end-all, be-all for me deep down. I can can know the things, and I still feel these certain ways. And so we need to bring that to the Lord, right, together. 
And of course, it's still 100% a reality for you to have this idolatry, even if you're married. That is one reason divorce is so common. What is supposed to be one of the strongest human uh, bonds in our society is increasingly tenuous and weak because for many, as soon as we aren't in love or the genital sexual passion starts withering, no pun intended, the marriage is obviously done. And it's the right thing to end the marriage when you fall out of love. That is our view. And now this isn't a marriage sermon, but if it was, this is the part where I would say, Ephesians 5 says that the marriage is the picture of God's unconditional love and commitment to us and his full giving of himself to us. And if that is true, then what Christians are saying to the world through our marriages about God is incredibly important. It is an incredibly important witness that the world desperately needs because I want my future marriage to communicate the truth to the world and to my spouse that God loves us no matter what and his commitment to me is permanent and not dependent only on emotions or feelings but is grounded in decision, action, and faithfulness. Back to the sex talk. Romance and sex have become our main vehicles for meaning and it's destroying us. That's what idolatry does. Idolatry doesn't form you. Idolatry deforms you. We try to wring infinity out of the finite. And these things, sexual, sexuality, it, it's, it's bigger than just itself. It points beyond itself. And it's supposed to point us to the one to whom we can really say, if I don't have this, I have nothing. If I don't have you, God, I have nothing. And he is the only thing that it is appropriate to say that to, the only one. And it's like the hardest thing in the world to convince somebody that they're an idolater, right? Which is basically what I'm accusing all of us of this morning, by the way, in case you're not picking up on that. So here's something helpful. Often in our lives, we don't recognize idolatry until uh, the thing that we idolize is taken away and it crushes us. So this is the litmus test. I asked my students at NWLC, what if I told you today that you would live a single life and you would not have sex? You would be celibate. Could you have a vision for life? Could you imagine a life of fullness, wholeness, meaning, purpose, joy, and intimacy? Like, for real, could you? Because everybody, everybody, all my students, they all assume they're just going to get married. Yeah, so did I. Don't you laugh at me. No, I'm kidding. It's fine. <laughs> right? And I still think that I, I desire, but I don't know. You don't, you might be single in here today. I'm asking you, do you have a vision for your life that is flourishing and it doesn't have to do with sexual and romantic fulfillment. And for you as a married person in here, you need to have that same vision or else you're gonna put undue pressure on your marriage and you don't know how your marriage, you don't know where your life is gonna go. This could be you as well. And I just fear that we have no framework for fullness or happiness outside of sexual or romantic fulfillment. And the indi another indicator is this. How do you feel when you read that little story in Matthew 22 where Jesus says there'll be no marriage in heaven and therefore presumably no sex in heaven? Some of you are just finding this out now, I'm sorry. You know the story I'm talking about? It's just a little thing. But uh, that's a bad thing to say in the talk like this, sorry. It's just a little, uh, it's a little story where Jesus just mentions this kind of offside to answer another question. And I remember reading that as a new Christian and being like, oh man, that sucks. Bummer. I don't want that. I, I want to be with my true love forever. And I didn't like that picture of heaven or the new heavens and the new earth. But that's just another uncovering of idolatry, isn't it? C.S. Lewis picks up on this when he writes this in his book, Miracles. Check this out. The letter of spirit in scripture and all of Christianity forbid us to suppose that life in the new creation will be a sexual life, like physically, like we'll be having sex. And it reduces our imagination to the withering alternatives either of bodies which are hardly recognizable as human bodies at all or else of a perpetual fast. As regards to the fast, I think our present outlook might be like that of a small boy who, on being told that the sexual act was the highest bodily pleasure, should immediately ask whether or not you ate chocolates at the same time. On receiving the answer no, he might regard the absence of chocolates as the chief characteristic of sexuality. In vain, you would tell him, the reason why lovers in their raptures don't bother about chocolates is they have something better to think of. The boy knows chocolate. He does not know the positive thing that excludes it. And we are in the same position. We know the sexual life. We do not know, except in glimpses, the other thing which in heaven will leave no room for it. Right? And the good news today is that yes, there's fullness, there's meaning, there's intimacy, even sexual wholeness for everyone, single or married. 
and we can be formed deeply by the Holy Spirit in this area. So uh, I want us, I want a vision. I want us to have a vision. I want all the people I know to have a vision of life where fullness and intimacy and happiness are not contingent on whether or not a fairy tale romance happens. So let's talk about how that can be a reality, and let's go to Scripture. Uh, if you want your Bibles there on the ends of the rows, you can pass them down. We're just going to be right on the front page there, right in Genesis 1 and 2. And uh, what does Scripture say? In her book, Sexual Character, Marva Dawn talks about the creation accounts in Genesis 1 and 2 and highlights how they display different aspects of humankind's sexuality. So we're going to read those two different accounts, and then we're going to talk about it, okay? So Genesis 1, verses, uh, I don't know, 26 through 28, something like that. Let me get there. Okay. So... God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the, all the creatures on the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Okay, really important thing here, being made in the image of God is linked to being made male and female. Very important, we'll talk about that more. God blessed them, said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth, subdue it, and rule over all the things. Okay, now, chapter two, verses 15 through, uh, through the end. Different account, different perspective on this creation account. The Lord took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it, take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the one we talked about earlier, or you'll certainly die. And the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a suitable helper for him. Now, the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and the birds, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took the side of Adam and then closed up that place with flesh. And then the Lord made a woman from the side he had taken out of the man. And he brought her to the man. The man said, now this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And that's why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. This is speaking specifically of genital sexual union and what that does. And Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. This is not speaking specifically of genital sexual union, by the way, that last statement. We'll get back to that. Okay. It encompasses that, but it's bigger than that. So, Marva, in her book, reads these two things. She goes, this helps us distinguish between two aspects of sexuality, genital sexuality and social sexuality. And that's what we're going to talk about in this point. Now, I admit it sounds kind of weird at first, social sexuality. um, And that's why I went and read her book, because she explicates it very well. And I think it's helpful, especially in light of Deborah's definition of sexuality in that broad sense as the desire to know and be known at all levels, emotional, physical, psychological, spiritual, all this knowing shouldn't and can't be done only by the romantic partner. It's an incredible amount of weight to put on a single human being. We need helpful, vast social networks to help us be whole in our social sexuality. So let's get to definitions here, okay? Genital sexuality, we'll start there. Uh, Pretty clear, Genesis 2 paints that picture of the special union between the man and the woman. And it's so significant that what it does is cause the man to separate from his family And this new genital union has formed a new family unit. And this is incredibly important in the biblical world for literal survival. The Bible considers a strong marital unit essential to societal well-being, with sex cementing the marital bond, controlled and confined within the marital, systemic, reinforced social order. Allowed free reign, it might destroy social arrangements and threaten the existence of civilization. Now, it sounds a bit intense, but it's very real. See, in this time, especially pre-monarchy, like monarchy, pre-nation, right? This is how people lived and survived. It was family, tribes, and clans, all connected to each other through the various bonds of, of genital sexuality, being family. When Adam says, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, that's, not just reser- that's a comment not reserved for just the uh, romantic partner. It's a comment that you would say to like second and third cousins. We see it used elsewhere in the Bible talking about that, those, those strong ties that come from the, the familial bonds, okay? So um, let's see here, where was I? The integrity of the, the family has to be maintained because it's how people survived, And so if that marriage union 
was separated or dissolved or hurt or whatever, like it's leveret marriage. If you've heard of this when we talk in other sermons, it's like if a guy dies, the brother is supposed to marry his widow. It's so she stays in the family and still can like actually practically live. And they need that, those offspring to actually practically live. That's why leveret marriage is a thing because it's a literally about survival. And we think it's less so in today's modern world and it's not really, it just looks different. We all know someone, or our very selves, have been very affected by genital sexuality expressed outside of the space of marriage. And I'm not talking just about being affected emotionally, like just hurt or something. I'm talking economically, practically, like the stability of our life has been taken away or was never even there in the first place because of the separation of genital sexuality and marriage. One of my best friends is a one night stand. This is so much bigger than just the individual's pleasure and personal, personal emotional sexual fulfillment. And this is one reason, at least one reason, why God reserves genital sexuality for marriage. Because sex is procreative and connective. It's a physically, chemically, physiologically, and spiritually bonding act of incredible, intentional, purposeful power. Okay, now let's talk about social sexuality. It sounds weird, because... Uh, you say sexuality, right? We think about the act of sex, and somehow we've managed to over-sexualize sexuality. Leave it to us. Good work. What is social sexuality? Genesis 1 says God created humankind, male and female, and both are in his image. And we are to be his image as we take care of creation. And part of that abil- is the ability between two sexed beings in physical bodies being able to multiply, but it's much, much, much bigger than that. To be created physically as male and female who are designed to complement each other in our differences means our sexuality is good and necessary to image God better. Sam Albury writes in his book, What God Has to Say About Our Bodies. Great, another book if you want to do some more reading on this stuff. Reflecting God as male and female may sound rather alien to much of Western society, but there's a level on which we instinctively recognize it. We sense that there are certain contexts where having only one sex present is diminishing in some way. We're aware of what some secular leadership spaces might lack if there are only men present. It is not just a question of representation or fairness. The interplay of our respective glories enriches all of us. By being male and female, our being male and female is designed to help us be better at being people. It's not just a matter of biology, but of theology. Not about the multiplication of humanity, but the fuller imaging of God. You see, all of Genesis 1 is this idea this idea of different things that unite to create greater beauty. Go back and read it. It starts with like, God creates day and night. Night, awesome, love stargazing, one of my favorite things in the world. Day, love it, it's warm, helps plants grow, need plants to live, thank you, day. Day and night, I love that they are different than we get them both. What I don't want day and night to do is to both like, just kind of become, I don't want it to be day all the time, I don't want it to be night all the time, and I don't want them to be like, like, blend together and just be the half and half and just be great all the time, which is Spokane for eight months of the year and we all get sad. Like technically sad, like seasonal effect. (laughs) We have our happy lights. You know what a happy light is, right? Whatever, okay. See, this is what happens when I get off script. It's your fault. It's not your fault at all. Why did I say that? Back to Genesis 1. Night and day, great, wonderful. Ocean, yes, rad. Mountains, love them too. I can experience both. Birds, yes, how'd they get up there? Fish, they can breathe water? What? Like, like all of the diversity of life. And then you get to men. Awesome, cool dudes. Ladies, you guys are rad. Gals, I said guys, gals. What? Guys and ladies, guys and ladies, guys and gals, ladies and gentlemen, people of the court. got me I don't know why but it's so cool that all people are different and part of that difference is our sexual difference but we relate to each other in our social sexuality for the fuller imaging of God with our different cultures and gifts and abilities and all the things Tim Keller says just get back on script Josh it's part of the brilliance of God's creation that diverse unlike things are made to unite and create dynamic holes which regenerate more and more life of beauty through their relationships. So 
when you relate to somebody as the person you are, as the woman you are, as the man you are, as whatever, like we regenerate more and more beauty and awesomeness in that social sexuality because the two things that were different paint a more full, beautiful picture when their differences are seen next to each other. This is the idea that Marva Dawn's getting at when she talks about social sexuality. She says, our social sexuality is composed of all aspects of our being that are distinct from specific feelings, attitudes, behaviors relating to or leading to genital union. So when I speak with you, I do not do so as a neuter. I relate to you as a woman with my particular body and spirit and mind, my whole self, which has discovered its identity within the framework of my being female. And to be really clear here, when she says within her framework of being female, she's not saying you need to conform to some sort of gender role or stereotype. She's not saying, yeah, as you are a guy, so you do sports, and you're a woman, so you make food in the kitchen. That's not what she's saying, and that's not what I am saying at all. It just means God has made her as who she is, as a woman. And she images him in that, in community with other women who are different, and men who are different. And it's okay to express your femininity and masculinity in various ways. But being men and women, different men and women, we better image God together as we fellowship in community as the men and women we are in our social sexuality. And in these relationships, we experience intimacy that is not romance. We are known and we know in varying degrees. And this is one of the big issues that I want to raise today. Is like we're in a world that's completely idolized romantic and sexual fulfillment. Therefore, we've lost our ability to understand intimacy apart from romance. It's a primary problem. We must understand that the desperation in our society for intimacy often leads to genital experimentation by those who truly long for social affection. Rich Reese states these words in his book. He says, many in our culture have assumed that the desire to truly belong and be seen by another requires an act of genital sexuality. In the process, we dangerously open ourselves up to others in the most vulnerable way, nakedness, to meet a need that doesn't require us to take off our clothes. If sex is our only vehicle for intimacy, we're in lots of trouble. This isn't a quote. These are, these are my words, but it's just a lot of them. So I'm going to put them on the screen. When we aren't supported as persons, known in community, and engaged in healthy social sexuality, the desperation of loneliness, the state of our culture, and the idolization of the nuclear family and dismissal of the single person in the church leaves us to think the only outlet for knowing and being known is genital sexuality. And sex is now no longer the covenantal recommitment to and celebration of a deep knowing and intimacy between two people for a lifetime in marriage, but it is the initiating act of fleeting relationship after fleeting relationship. We don't understand that our sexual longings are a microcosm of our spiritual longings, and genital sexuality is a mere sliver of the pie called intimacy. Marva Dawn writes, our society looks for good sex as a relief for its soul suffering. But prevalent sexual behaviors don't come close to touching the profound pain. And what is, what's the pain she's talking about? She's not talking about just the pain of being alone. It's bigger. It's deeper. She's talking about the pain of being unknown. Because if sexuality is what Deborah Hirsch says, this longing to know and be known on all levels, emotional, psychological, spiritual, physical, we cannot just address only the physical. We're so hamstrung in our cultural environment that the only way we know how to scratch that itch is sex. So what do we do? This is the last part of the message. It's five practices from Rich's book for sexual wholeness. So we're gonna kind of blast through these five fairly quickly. And here they are. The naming of sexually deformed messages. The practice of naming sexually deformed messages. We are all sexually broken. We've all inherited messages from culture, families, experience, abuse, and so on, that have deformed a healthy understanding of sexuality for us. And this is a good starting place where we just need to sit down with a piece of paper. Like, I really, like, do you know your sexually deformed messages? Because how can we stand against something with Jesus if we haven't identified it? How can we bring something to the Lord in pain and humility for healing if we don't know what ails us? Do you know your deformed messages? about sex, please, please actually do this this week. If you're married, write this down with your spouse and, and share it. If you're not married, get with somebody who you trust who's a safe person and name these things out loud. And, and so you might be asking, like, what does this look like? I'm gonna give a bunch of examples of different sentences 
that are examples of D4 messages. And hopefully it just gives you like a running start to understand what I'm looking for here and what Rich is looking for here, okay? So here you go. Some might look like this. If I don't change my body, nobody will ever want to sleep with me or love me. If I don't sleep with someone, they won't want to stay in a relationship with me. If I have this urge, it would be damaging to me if I don't act on it. See, all of these things, by the way, these are all things where Jesus is some sort of answer, some sort of full answer. My sexual desirability defines my worth and makes me lovable or unlovable. What does the gospel say to that? The gospel says you are loved because you are you. You don't need to be something that you're not to be loved. That's what the gospel says. So that's how you address these with the gospel, right? Some more D4 messages. My sexual desirability defines my worth, makes me lovable or unlovable. Sex is only a physical act that doesn't affect my, my soul, my person, who I am. If I'm celibate, it'll be impossible to be happy. My past will make someone not want to be with me, so I might as well just continue doing what I want. I feel good about myself only when I know people want me sexually. So hopefully those are helpful examples for you to name what are your deformed messages. At the very least, it's a starting place where we can take these to our close community in Jesus and let his grace and the gospel confront the lies head on. Next practice, the practice of sobriety. I like how Rich clarifies this. He says sobriety is not marked by abstinence and willpower, but by honesty. It's not about moral perfection, but wrestling authentically. Sexual idolatry has taken us captive and it has a hold. Pornography use, premarital, extramarital sex, addiction, abuse, sex manipulation, all of the things. Shame surrounding all of this sexual disorder keeps us quiet and in the dark about it. And let me tell you, there's freedom. There are people who care. There's a savior who doesn't condemn you, but who sympathizes, because guess what? He had a body. He was a sexual person. He sympathizes. He actually, for real, for real, for real, understands the struggles that you bring to him. There's a savior who cares and is there and helps. If there's one thing that you can do that is incredibly practical and helpful, it's to wrestle authentically. Confess whatever is going on. Get it in the light. Don't waste away in the dark. Psalm 32, David writes, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Some of us know what that feels like. Some of us know what it's like to be what Bonhoeffer will say in a, in a quote in a minute, utterly alone in our sin. Confession is not done in the darkness of silent prayer. Confession is done face to face with another caring believer, with another brother or sister in Christ who walks through that with you, who looks you in the eyes and pronounces forgiveness and love of Christ, that he has given them his image to be able to do that for you. We need that. And if we're gonna be a church where we can practice sobriety safely and well, we desperately need these words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer from Life Together. He says, confess your faults to one another, quoting James chapter five. He who is alone in his sin is utterly alone. It may be that Christians, notwithstanding, or meaning in spite of, Christians in spite of corporate worship, common prayer, and all their fellowship and service, all these spiritual activities that we do, in spite of all these things, we may still be left to our loneliness. The final breakthrough to real fellowship does not occur because though they have fellowship with one another as believers and as devout people, they don't have fellowship as the undevout, as sinners. The pious fellowship permits no one to be a sinner. So everybody must conceal his sin from himself and from the fellowship. We dare not be sinners. Many Christians are unthinkably horrified when a real sinner is discovered among the righteous. So we remain alone in our sin, living in lies and hypocrisy. And the fact is, we are sinners. But it is the grace of the gospel, which is so hard for the pious to understand, that it confronts us with the truth and says, you are a sinner, a great, desperate sinner. Now come as the sinner that you are to God who loves you. He wants you as you are. He does not want anything from you, a sacrifice, a work. He wants you alone. My son, give me thine heart. God has come to you to save the sinner. Be glad. Is there something in your life right now that's preventing you from walking in sexual wholeness primarily or solely because it is unknown 
to every, everybody else. Nobody else knows this thing because it's a secret from everyone. Practice sobriety, wrestle with it authentically, and find freedom in the light. Now, if you need some more resources on sexual sobriety, I want you to also look up Jay Stringer on Google, okay? This guy's great, very, very helpful. Helps you identify reasons why we have the urges we have and all the things and, and what is, what's behind these actions and just go look them up, okay? Okay, last, one, last couple here. The practice of social bonding. This one's about understanding that intimacy does not equal romance. A human can thrive without romance, but they will die without intimacy. Social bonding is sharpening our ability to engage social sexuality. It means living life connected to others in life-giving ways. Some of us put all that weight on our spouse, like I said, and it just, that's too much. It's not meant for that. Like Marva says, we have this longing to be known, and we think we need to immediately short-circuit that to genital sexuality to actually be known, and that's not the answer. So here's an excerpt from her book, A Story, where she talks about uh, wrestling with her loneliness as a single person. She says this, during one of the loneliest periods of my many single years, I found myself faced with a very inviting possibility for an affair. As I wrestled within myself, debating between the side of me that wanted to be faithful to my previous deliberate choice of celibacy and the side of me that wanted to rebel against that constantly careful self-discipline, I tested my thoughts by opening up the issue with a close Christian friend. Okay, right there, by the way, that's practicing sobriety. That's what it looks like. After I lamented how lonely I was and how wonderfully, fully comforting the possible affair seemed, Dan responded, I want to be here for you when you come back. I asked what he meant, and he continued, if you have an affair, you'll regret it. I want to help pick up the pieces when you hate yourself. Good heavens, if my Christian brother loves me like that, who needs an affair? What I truly needed at that point was not genital experimentation, but the security and comfort of knowing experientially that someone genuinely cared about me. I needed to know I was not alone in my pain. That's what social bonding looks like. And here's what I get to say here. I mentioned it briefly earlier. Generally, the church doesn't do great of wrapping in the single person, be they divorced, widowed, unmarried, disabled, celibate. If I'm gonna stand up here and say, hey, there's fullness and intimacy here for everyone in this community. For someone who's not engaging in genital sexuality, there's fullness and flourishing and fulfillment for you. We need to be a community and a people who put our money where our mouth is. Don writes, those of us who care must take seriously the imperative need to create an alternative milieu, which is a social environment. You see, the church very much tends to put the nuclear family on a pedestal. Nuclear family, mom, dad, kids. It is, is it important? Absolutely, yes. In a perfect world, the intact familial unit is paramount for societal stability and flourishing, but we aren't in an ideal world, and not all of us are in those situations. So look at what Jesus says, Mark chapter 10. Truly I tell you, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much when in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields, along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. What is Jesus doing when he addresses this? He creates a new family a family that transcends the nuclear family, where widows and orphans are cared for, where the single person has intimacy, where not only possessions, but lives are shared. So Paul can say confidently in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 to the church, he can say, if you're unmarried, it's good to remain so. Being single is a viable and commendable way of life because of the church is being the church, as Jesus outlined here, because anybody who followed Jesus in this time, you know what they had to do? They had to leave that stable familial unit. So what that meant for them is literal, possible, practical destitution of life. So Jesus is saying, when you follow me and you leave all of that stability, that actual practical stability you have, I promise you, the church will be there to support you. Practically, here in this present age. Not just socially, but what it also to say, homes, fields, you'll have shelter, you'll have food. You'll have a way to remain living. And that's who we need to be still for the single person in our midst. Paul says being single is viable because that's who he expects the church to be. Being single no longer means economic, relational, and social destitution. Marva, again, she says, I'm convinced that if the church could provide more 
thorough affection and care for persons, many would be less likely to turn to genital sexual expression for the social, social support they need. It's always interesting to me, and not interesting, it's fine, it's totally good. But like whenever there's a pastor, a guest speaker, somebody at a conference or here or at a youth group or at a camp or whatever, what do they always do first thing when they introduce themselves? They show themselves a picture of their family. They show themselves. <laughs> no, they show you a picture of their family. That's fine and good. But if we're gonna paint the picture of this vision of the New Testament family that transcends the nuclear family, we need to be showing more pictures than just that. We need to be showing pictures like what I'm gonna show you. Can I show you some pictures? Okay, cool, and here's why I'm doing this. I'm not doing this to say, look at how good I am at this. I'm very good at it, but no, I'm blessed by it, okay? But what I'm saying to you is, I'm saying this is not just a pipe dream, this is not an ideal, this can be a reality for you. You can have intimacy in your life. It's possible. Okay, pictures. Okay, so that's my family. It's kind of a pixelated picture, but you know, deal with it. You can still tell it's me, because it's just all the hair. Um, that's graduation, that's my mom, my dad. Love them, they're great. Okay, next picture. My sister's in this one on the left there. My dad, me, and my sister's roommate down in Florida, super cool. The dog's awesome. Dog diarrhea all over the beach in front of a couple families, hilarious. I had to get a bucket of sand and just like pour it over it. And it's like, somebody's gonna step in that tomorrow. Anyway, keep going. Okay, so this is a picture of my best friends in the world, James and Ashley Gerber. Um, that's what I look like in the morning, by the way. <laughs> uh, so I show, they're, they're just my best friends in the world for like, I don't know, 15 years now. They got five kids. I just uh, spent so much time with them. I love them. They live in Salem now because they're stupid. But, <laughs> but this was when we were visiting. And I show this picture on purpose because this is like first thing in the morning. And this is what Genesis 2 means by like naked and unashamed. Not necessarily just the genital union, uh, but it's talking about just like, are there, are there people who like know what you look like in the morning? You know? There's no makeup in this picture. I had to ask, I was like, Ashley, can I show this picture? And she's like, fine. But like, like are there people who know what you look like in the morning? Not because you slept with them the night before, but because you're close. You're naked and unashamed with them in your life, in life-giving ways. They can speak, they fought, like, I fought with like cats and dogs with all of the people in all these pictures I'm gonna show you, okay? So let's keep going here. Um, we went on vacation together. Like that's the thing that like married people go on vacation. Like I went with them. <laughs> And third wheel in the old Disneyland. It was awesome, though. Like, we shared a hotel room, separate beds, but I snore. They hated me. It was great. Keep going. Uh, this is me with, like, them and all their kids, and I think there's an extra kid there, too. Yeah, they don't have that many. They have one extra. There's one extra in this picture. But James was, like, working that day. I was like, okay, I'm just going to, like, go hang with the fam. We're going to run errands and stuff. Like, that's what I'm talking about. Like, your life is with these people. Like, we just went to friggin', I don't know, the park in Walmart or whatever, like, that's what I'm talking about with social bonding, like just doing regular boring life with these people. And they're super boring, okay? But <laughs> no, but like I'm saying married people, have the single person over to your house and like during when you're the craziness of bedtime and figuring life out and everything, and single person, be willing to go to the married people's houses because they can't like go out like you can all the time. So be willing to just go sit on a couch and do nothing. It's good for them, and it's good for you, okay? This is a picture of their youngest, and it's just cute, so I want to show it. Uh, keep going here. This is my other best friends in the world, Jesse and Miranda Clot. They're three boys. That's me on their family camping trip with them that I go on with them every year, and looking forward to it here next month. Next picture, just me with their kids, just, just hanging out, doing things. Crosby driving the boat. We all died that day. That's Ollie with their youngest and my motorcycle, because I want you to know how cool I am. And keep going. <laughs> This, this is the NWLC staff, Alicia, Damon, and Miranda, again, on the, on the side there. This is a Christmas present they got me. <laughs> it's, a, it's a hoodie with their pictures on it. <laughs> okay, you want to know what a healthy social bonding looks like. Do you have a picture, or do you have a hoodie <laughs> with a picture of your friends on it, huh? That's kind of weird, actually, but whatever. So Alicia just had a kid, and me and Miranda took a picture and put it on a baby onesie and gave it to her at a baby shower, and it was funny. So I can't wait to be puked on, but anyway... So, and there are people, plenty more people in my life, single, young, old, married, all, they would be offended that I didn't put their picture up right now. I just, I gotta get going. We're running out of time, okay? And so the thing I'm just, show, I'm just saying this is possible. I'm not trying to show it off or anything. I'm saying this, there's hope, this is real, okay? Practice of touch. Fourth one, the practice of touch. Sam Alberry writes, we increasingly find ourselves in a culture that doesn't know how to do physical contact. The slogan of a professional cuddling agency, the answer thing, by the way, seems to have put its finger on the issue, so to speak. We're sex-obsessed, but touch-deprived. 
There's much to this, and in Western culture, we have collapsed sex and intimacy together to the extent that it's hard for people to conceive of intimacy that is not sexual at its core. So more and more, we associate touch with being sensual rather than being familial. There's something about physical contact that does something words can't sometimes, whether it's just a simple hand on the shoulder or a hug that lasts a little bit longer, but not in like the creepy way. We're physical beings, and we will be physical beings in the new heavens and the new earth, so we need to learn how to be physical in our relationships in healthy and life-giving ways now. Rich writes, the act of healthy touch in church settings is profoundly needed and, we must, and must be carefully discerned. Healthy touch is part of social sexuality. We understand that many's lives are affected either by abusive touch or by the severe absence of touch. But Jesus models a healthy, caring touch for us. The leper comes to him to be healed. The leper who is ostracized from all community, he's been absent of, of any sort of contact with people for God knows how long, probably years and Jesus could heal him by snapping his fingers, just by saying the word. And what does he do? He reaches out and he touches the man. Touch acknowledges the other, respects them as the other, communicates God's love, concern, empathy. It's not just a healing of a body, but the restoration of a community. I don't think about how I know the absence of touch until someone like touches me and I'm like, oh, like I needed that. And I didn't, I forgot that I needed that. So we need to learn how to practice healthy physical touch again. And finally, the practice of making love. Uh, I don't know, let's pray. <laughs> nah, just, I read, I, read, I read the book, it's fine. Rich says you need to be careful not to fall prey to the myth that genital sexual relations are effortless, flawless, and always beyond this world. We've been shallowly formed by hyper-sexualized depictions in media and pornography, and we are shaped to see it merely as the act itself that has no significance and depth beyond the physical. But the, his main point in this section is that lovemaking requires all our being. If we can't separate body and soul, and we cannot, if we see ourselves as whole integrated beings as we are, what we do with our body, we understand we do with our very selves to the core. And this is why when you give your naked body to another person, what you're saying and demonstrating in marriage context is that you give your whole self to that person naked and unashamed in your physicality to say with, with my whole self, with all I am, all I have, all I will ever become, it is entrusted to you and only you at this level. It's communication more than activity. It's trust more than lust. And it's another reason why this type of sexual union needs to be protected and bolstered by marriage, by the marriage covenant relationship. And it's in this way where God reveals his complete, full, naked, and unashamed love for us meaning he knows and sees every bit of us, all of us fully and still, knowing all the good, bad, happy, sad, he offers everything he is to us freely and faithfully. And that's for the married and the single. So there you have it. Those are the five practices, not all exhaustive, but hopefully helpful. And this was a lot. So let me give a little summary recap real quick here, and then I'll send you on your way. Sexual wholeness is offered for everyone. Married, single, divorced, disabled, widowed, celibate, Sexuality and spirituality both speak of deep longing and desire to know and be known on all levels, physical, psychological, emotional, spiritual, and be known by God and people. We are being deformed by an idolatrous relationship with sexual and romantic fulfillment. If we don't have sex, we have nothing. But there's a vision for life that is full, complete, happy, knowing and being known, being naked and unashamed that does not hinge on a fairy tale romance and genital sexual expression. In fact, a big problem of ours is that we fail to distinguish between genital sexuality and social sexuality, and in our deep longings to be known, in the midst of fear of being unknown, in the pain of being unknown, many look for belonging and meaning in genital sexuality when it's offered in fullness in social, social sexuality. Intimacy is not exclusively experienced in romance for the married or the single. And if we're to be a church community where we can really say to our congregants and to the world, sex is not the end all be all of life, we must be people committed to creating an alternative social environment in the power of the spirit under the unity of Christ. And at the very least, we can start this by the five practices, naming deformed messages, practicing sobriety, socially bonding, relearning healthy physical touch, and making meaningful love. And we take hold of the gospel that says you are known, you are loved, and someone has given themselves to you fully. Jesus, and do you dare respond in kind and let that relationship be the primary one that shapes everything about who you are? I'm gonna end with a prayer. It's a, it's a benediction of sorts. It's written. I borrowed some of this language from 
Marva Don's book, and then I kind of changed some stuff on my own. So you're welcome to pray with your eyes open and read along if you like. But let me, let me pray for us. Lord, we offer ourselves to you, seeking to know and to be known. May we be a church where the relationships are a source of healing and strength for those who have been broken by the lack of sexual wholeness in our world. May the love of Christ at work in us make us a church that looks to enfold and encourage those who are struggling in their sexuality in any number of ways, those suffering in loneliness, victims of abuse, those who've been abandoned or rejected in divorce, children of unpeaceful homes, women who grieve in abortion, single persons who long to be married but find no godly companions, teenagers who are overwhelmed by peer pressures, persons in troubled marriages, and any others who need to be seen, known, and experience genuine intimacy. May the way we engage our sexuality be a beacon of hope and a witness to the world of your goodness, your holiness, and your love. Amen. Thanks, friends. 